Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday to you. It's good to get a chance to share with you. I know a little bit of a different context today and a different background. I apologize for that, but trust that uh, the message today, the Word of God, will work in your hearts, uh, even if it's a little bit of a different scenery than maybe you're used to. It is Palm Sunday. What is Palm Sunday? Palm Sunday is the day where Jesus Christ fulfilled one of the most amazing prophecies in the entire Bible. Scholars and historians go back and they look at hundreds of different prophecies. But this is the one probably that if we fully understood it and kind of avoided some of the common misunderstandings would actually do more to solidify our faith and to convince us that this is the absolute word of God than, than maybe any other prophecy at all. Save less than maybe the resurrection or something like that. But it comes to us out of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 where we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph. O oh, daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Amazing prophecy, basically 500 plus years before Jesus was ever born, the Jewish prophets predicted that he would enter into Jerusalem riding on this donkey which of course there's tons of, of thought there like why a donkey just the humility of the whole thing and so forth but then if we read the fulfillment of it and, and join me today if you would in, in luke chapter 19 and what we call the the triumphal entry that's kind of more our name um, than anything else but Luke chapter 19, verse 28 says, After he had said these things, he went up on ahead, going to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethpage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you there, and as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and um, those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Hey, why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Right? Blessed is the King, our coming Messiah, who comes in the name, that's the position and entity basically of our King. Lord of Yahweh, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Verse 41, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known this day, even you, the things which make for peace... But now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children with you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation or if you read from the niv you'll see there they tried to add some clarity you will not recognize the time of god's visitation when literally the god man came and visited you so traditionally it is assumed that this is when jesus officially offered himself to israel as the messiah i i think well if that's the case gosh did they not respond fairly well i mean the next week the crowd turns on him these same people that were saying blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord would shout out to crucify him so what went wrong because at face value if this was an offer i think they responded fairly well branches and everything but i, I think there's some inaccuracies there 
From the very beginning, John the Baptist publicly was preparing Israel, and they knew what John was doing because they had a messianic timeline out of Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. And we're going to consider that here in a moment. So they actually had, if you go back into their commentaries, they had uh, committee rules in place and all sorts of things to investigate possible messianic claims that's why they went straight to john you read about that in matthew chapter 3 and so forth and then of course as soon as john was arrested jesus himself began to proclaim himself as the messiah and he began to validate those claims with the miracles spoken of in this text the people saw the miracles the miracles were undeniable nobody ever denied his miracles they just attributed them not to god and to the spirit of god but ultimately to the devil so john proclaimed it Jesus proclaimed it and validated it with miracles. Then at one point out, he sent out the 12, and he gave them authority over demons who were trying to suppress the incarnation. And they went out and validated it. So John, Jesus, the 12, all validating the Messiah is here. Then later he sent out the 72 to do the same thing. They were going city to city, literally saying the kingdom of God is here. Our Jewish friends would have understand that. The Messiah is here. And as you transition through the scriptures, you realize they knew full well what the miracles meant. They knew everything. They didn't deny the miracles. They just rejected Jesus as the Messiah because he didn't fit the bills. So they had been offered the kingdom and they had already rejected it. Now that does not mean individual Jewish people, of course, could not come to salvation. It never means that. It means that when you see the words of judgment spoken of in verse 41, let's go through this again. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. But far from offering them anything, he literally, he's riding down on this donkey. You've probably seen some sort of reenactment of it. He's riding down this hill. It's the most amazing thing. I've walked in a trip over there, and he just starts crying. Jesus is just crying, and you're just going, oh, my goodness, what is hitting him so hard? Well, he realizes the end is near. He knows what's going on with his crowd. They've already, as a nation, completely rejected the, the idea that he was the divine Messiah, and he spoke only words of judgment against them, basically prophetically saying Rome is going to come in here and completely destroy this, and they did. In 70 AD, Rome rode in, killed over a million Jewish people. The rest of them, the diaspora, scattered throughout the known world, primarily in Europe. And of course, we could pick up our study in ancient history in the 13th century and so forth and follow their progression all the way back to the World War, which gave them their land and so forth. But no, I, I do not see a Jesus showing up going, hey, now it's time to make a decision. Now's the offer. Accept me or else. It's just not what happened. They had already made their decision, and so literally Jesus came in crying over the disaster. And I think it's so personal and it's so powerful, and I think we're going to do it separated from a holiday, but when we really get into the garden, there's nothing of uh, Gethsemane, there's nothing that impacts us other than the, the humanity of Jesus as he kind of cries out. At one point, you even see him talk about his his, his failure to, to reunite the house of Judah back to God and some other things, but... Um, just really, really sad. What was he weeping over? I remember, remember, Jesus is God incarnate. He's Yahweh himself. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. It was him that walked in the garden with Adam. And he, and he watched that one sin. He didn't want robots. So he gave them that free will to decide, and they rebelled against him. And so have all of we. But he saw what became of that simple renaissance act of defiance where Adam said, no, thank you. I want to be in charge. You, you, the murder, the mayhem, the wars, the devastation to the human race has got to be front and center on Jesus' heart. And then everything he had done, how many times throughout the Old Testament, throughout their Bible, did he portray these truths to Israel? He gave them indications like the, the story of Abraham and Isaac, where the, the son just kind of goes willing to be sacrificed under the, this, the hand of the father. And, and it just echoes the, the text of Isaiah where he was like, a lamb led to slaughter and they had the Passover celebration and they had all these amazing things and yet when they got this incredible chunk of truth from God they completely rejected it and pursued their own righteousness and pursued their own things I, I think it devastated him I think this passion week as we call it 
Uh, and we call it that, by the way, because it's something that King, the old King James referred to it as his passion, what he was passionate about and so forth. But um, yeah, he was not in a very raw sense offering himself as the Messiah. Individuals in that crowd put two and two together and believed that he was their divine savior. In that moment, their sins are forgiven, just like you and I. But in a broader sense, that's not necessarily what is going on here. It's what a lot of people assume. No offer was made only words of judgment and a disastrous future. So if he wasn't presenting himself as the here I am, uh, cats out of the bag, um, the secrets, that there was never a secret. There was time and place where Jesus said, Shh, you don't tell anybody. Because he wanted people to discover things on their own. He wanted them to see the miracles, know the Old Testament, and pursue them. They didn't want all this word of mouth and so forth. So there were strategic reasons why we hear things like, Shh, don't tell anybody. But we bought into the idea that his messianic role was some massive secret, and, and I push back on that every chance I get. It's not the case, and one of the reasons I push back on it, a little rabbit trail here, is because seeing <clears throat> the distinction in Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 13, where Jesus transitions away from doing miracles to validate his office in an attempt to get Israel to repent and accept them as the Messiah. He was done with that. That very day that they attributed his miracles to the devil, he began to speak in parables and that's why this text says these things have been hidden from your eyes he hid them by teaching in parables they wouldn't understand he transitioned from israel to the disciples in preparation for their ministry of which you my friends and myself are a product we are a product of the time he spent with those disciples they were commissioned to start the church they carried the baton so by pointing these things out i, I just take us back to that greatest transition matthew 12 luke 13 because if we miss it, then we begin to treat the synoptic gospels in the same way we might treat the book of Romans or Ephesians as is carrying so much theological weight for the church. It really does, and it carries a lot of theological weight for the individual disciple who she needs to pick up his cross, as it were, and follow Jesus. But we don't want to mix up when Jesus is offering eternal life and when he's challenging the twelve, and missing this transition causes that. So if he wasn't presenting himself as the Messiah for the first time in that original sense, what was he doing? Well, he was actually presenting himself as the Passover lamb. See, Israel had a number of feasts. It had the Feast of Tabernacles, which would be celebrated in our September, and their Sukkot, I believe it's called. Um, and they had the, the Feast of the Passover. All of these feasts portrayed a future experiential relationship that Israel would have with their Messiah, right? So the Passover pointed to the atonement, right? Where the blood of the Messiah would be shed for the forgiveness of sins. Very consistent with Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53. You get into Psalm 22, right? So the Passover has got to be front and center to bring us the peace with God. It really does portray the cross. Then you would take the Feast of Tabernacles, and that at the Feast of Tabernacles is where they would celebrate this feast every September in preparation for their Messiah coming. So they would walk through a number of rituals, some of which included the reading of Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and so forth, and then the palm branches and all that. And what the Feast of Tabernacles looked to is a time when essentially we went 100% back to the Garden of Eden, where redeemed mankind now lived in tabernacle, means to dwell together with their Messiah. That would be celebrated in September. Well, it wasn't September. It was March, and very specific date in March, and I'll, I'll get back to that in just a minute. The bottom line here, guys, is our Jewish friends, because of ideas, agendas, and the concept of the blind following the blind, they had the wrong feast. They were throwing down palm branches thinking, yes, if he's the Messiah, fix all of our problems. Get rid of Rome, make us wealthy, make us comfortable. We want all these fancy things. They had the wrong feast at the wrong time and for the wrong motivation. Now I'm going to come back to that because it's absolutely nothing short of amazing that we see the same things today.
right? We want to talk about the cross. We want to talk about the blood and the atonement. And we, we try and separate moralism from that. Like your moral adjustments have no business commingling with the blood of the divine, right? Keep the fuzzy relationship. God bless me. I love you, Father, Abba, Father. All that stuff needs to stand on the other side of the Passover, needs to stand on the other side of the cross. And so what happens today is we project over or quickly through the cross and we present to people an intimate relationship void of the spread of divine blood in that intimate relationship we errantly project something on them essentially along the lines of, of this grand master plan of prosperity and then people grow disenchanted and worse than that they regrow, they grow resentful. They resent the very savior that they claim to have believed in because he didn't bring with him all of the perks and benefits that they wanted in life. And it's actually really, really sad. But what's interesting is Exodus chapter 12. I, I want to cover this for a minute because if you're interested, I'd love to follow up with you on this. But I don't want to take a whole lot of time today because the reality is most of us accept the Christian faith without a whole lot of questions. And we don't dig into the deeper things. But this holiday can be pinpointed without using the New Testament, which is where any fabrication would have occurred, by looking at the Old Testament, by looking at Persian history, and by looking at the Jewish calendar and Roman history, we can actually pinpoint the very day that Jesus rode in on this donkey. It's fantastic and powerful. I'm going to try and explain it for just a minute without dwelling on it too long. And if I've got your attention, you can use YouTube and look at the chronology by Dr. Harold Honer. It's absolutely fantastic. Or Sir Robert Anderson. And I'm going to try and capture a little bit of what they've learned in their PhD dissertations. Okay, I mentioned Exodus 12. We're literally a week before the Passover, a week-ish, the Jewish people would bring a lamb into their home. And in that home, they would observe it and inevitably perhaps bond with it for a week to make sure it was without blemish. At the end of that week, then, they would take it, they would lay their hands on it, it would die for their sins, the blood would be put on the doorposts, etc., etc. So what Jesus was doing was he was presenting himself as that Passover lamb. And he spent that entire week, if we were to go through that, and we will, but we won't do it in the holiday rush mode, we'll go through and see that he stood up and proved himself to be a lamb unblemished. And as that unblemished lamb, he went to the cross. He was attacked by leadership, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, everybody went after him, and they all left with their tail between their legs. Now, the Bible does give us <clears throat> an idea of when all this would have occurred. Let me just try and explain this for a minute. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, the prophet Daniel had been reading from the book of Jeremiah. And he's realized, wait a minute, 70 years. That's how long we're supposed to be in captivity. Daniel went there as a young boy. He's very old. He's smart. He realizes, wait a minute, things are wrapping up here. In the next couple few years, we're going to be allowed to go home. Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 then is the Bible's only messianic timeline. And I'm just going to sum it up for you. He says from the issuing of a decree there'll be a set of seven. Now they use sevens in the same way we might use a dozen. Dozen flowers, dozen donuts, dozen this, dozen that. So he uses a set of seven. Basically in a nutshell, one of the laws after Israel entered the land that they absolutely never kept was giving the land a Sabbath rest. So God basically says, you own my land 70 years of rest, so out you go for 70 years to make a point. So Daniel's thinking, much like our 70 years is up, and now we get our Messiah and our blessed kingdom, right? And God says, wrong, no. You made up for those years you didn't give the land rest, but because of your refusal, you owe me another 490 years of proper in the land. Now, God takes that and breaks it down into essentially two sections. You have a 483-year section, and then this remaining seven years. The remaining seven years, we now know, because we have the full revelation of the New Testament, is the time of Jacob's trouble. That is a future seven years. Years. Okay, now strap in and track with me for a minute here, okay? 
When's the issuing of the decree? If we go to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was a wine taster for the king. Now, that's not necessarily a fellowship job because everybody wanted to kill the king. So when the king had wine made, he would hand it to Nehemiah, see if Nehemiah survived. So Nehemiah sips the wine, doesn't drop dead. He then serves the king. Now, I don't know if Nehemiah slipped in an extra glass or two of Merlot, but the king seemed to be bonding just fine. And ultimately, he asked Nehemiah, hey, Nehemiah, what's going on? And Nehemiah says, Look, I want to go home. I want my people to go home. And so ultimately, I'm being silly, whether the wine was involved or not, Nehemiah's ministry, Nehemiah's role, they got the decree. And if we look in Nehemiah, there's a little bit of dating. It says in the 20th year, etc., etc., of Artaxerxes. I'm going to call him Artie going forward, if that's okay. In the 20th year of Artie's reign. So now we go back and look in Persian history, lo and behold, tells us when his dad died. So therefore, we know the year there was around 464. Then we know in Persian history on May the 1st. Uh, 444 B.C., Artie says, go. Go and rebuild. In fact, Artie's like, dude, here, let me write something up for you. People are going to give you wood. They're going to give you everything you absolutely need. Now, okay, let's go back for a minute to Daniel's timeline. The decree had been issued, and now you've got to do a little bit of math. And this is where Sir Robert Anderson or Dr. Harold Honer really comes in. So the first section is 483 years, but the years must be calculated as Jewish years. So those are solid 30 days per month. So they are three. 160 years. Then you realize there's 1 AD skips to 1, or excuse me, 1 BC skips to 1 AD. There's no zero year. Remove the zero year. Adjust for leap years. Realize that our dating system started like in 9th, 10th century, came back to match all this up. So there may be some things inconsistent. But the bottom line is that you can come up with 177,330 days. Okay, until the Messiah would come. Then you fast forward and project that into Roman history. You need to find a Passover that was on a Friday under the rule of Pontius Pilate. We do the math and that puts Jesus riding in on that donkey. And we now understand the fulfillment of Daniel 9.24 and the book of Nehemiah's uh, recording of the decree puts Jesus riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday before his crucifixion, which we believe would have been April 3rd of 33 AD, which puts Palm, the first Palm Sunday on March 26th, I believe. Now, to a lot of us, we're like, hey, just give me more Jesus. That's all fantastic. Do you understand? It would be absolutely impossible for the New Testament authors to have calculated any of this. They didn't have the knowledge of the Persian history. They didn't have the knowledge of Roman history. And this absolutely would be unable to fake this. It's probably one of the most powerful things in the Bible if you take the time to study it out. But most of us are like, hey, I believe in Jesus. I'm not worried about the time. I'm told. And, and that's fantastic. But there is an expectation that we know these things, right? Even what Christ says interacting with them. You didn't know the time of your visitation. You didn't get your Old Testament solid enough, right? And is there not a strong, massive point of application in the New Testament? Because in the same way that he came the first time, we are told he's coming back. Now, we do not have the same timeline at all. There's, there's no timeline. And we know he's coming back first part way for the church and then with the church to establish his kingdom but I wonder when he comes back the second time for us, if he might say something similar, as you were completely unaware, you were completely unprepared for me, for the judgment seat of Christ, you were still living in your sin, you're still being selfish, and all those things. Did you not know this was going to happen? And, and it just so there's a little bit of a play there in application. But let's go back to what we were first talking about. Let's go back and talk about these mixing up of these holidays and essentially their motivation. Because by the end of that week, they went from throwing down palm branches, right, and yelling, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, to yell and crucify him. And Pilate goes, wait a minute, behold your king. And they're like, we have no king but Caesar. Essentially, what they had become was a crowd full 
of Judas's. And we see Judas Iscariot. He never believed in Jesus as his divine Savior. I think Jesus would do better if he'd never been born. Like, there's no doubt about his eternal destiny, in my opinion. But how is it that this happens? How is it that people spend so much time in and around him, and yet they're shelling crucify him? Because, and this is what's true of us today, and this is what's very dangerous for us. The greatest need we have, the greatest need the Old Testament had, the greatest need any human being has, is the need for atonement, the need for propitiation, that which satisfies the wrath of a holy God on behalf of a wretched sinner, right? We have a tendency to blow through that in our messaging, and our messaging projects the perks of Christianity. You have to be so, so careful with this. There are perks. You get to call the God of this universe your Father, I mean, the Abba Father, almost a daddy concept, if you will. Those are powerful truths. And we, we project the idea of this loving father with this great plan. But sometimes we overstep ourselves and we begin to paint him as someone who will provide, who will heal, who will do all the wonderful things that will happen at the second coming, either in heaven, if you want to call it that, or the kingdom here on earth, before the perks of tabernacling with God comes the cross. We cannot skip the cross. I don't care how lovey-dovey you are. I don't care you kind of grew up in one of those households where I've always believed in God. I've always loved God. I've always, he's been wonderful and he's provided this and provided that. He's never let my family down. I, I, I want to hear your testimony too. I think that's fantastic. We just have to be so careful that we do not project a lovey-dovey God and skip the cross. Right? And we also have to be careful that we are not over-projecting based on understanding some promises. The reality is Jesus was homeless. The reality is the twelve suffered immensely and died. And as we've talked about recently, God tells us, be content with food and clothing. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. In fact, my death, my rejection is a model for you to follow. You will love them until they kill you. I mean, literally. So we've created a Christianity where there's all these little side ministries. Oh, do this and you'll get healed. Do this and you'll get wealthy. Do this and this plan for your life. And I mean, some of that has an element of truth to it. But when we project that, it had better be when that individual stares the law, God's holy standard. Love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, all your mind, and that means all the time. Do you want a lovey-dovey God? That's the condition you come to him for your lovey-dovey. Or you come through the cross at which Christ fulfills all that for you. But we just have this bad habit of blasting through the cross, blasting through the idea of being born again, and right into inviting people into this relationship. I mean, this is as much fact as any other scientific thing. We, as broken human beings, will carry our concept of our Father right over into our Heavenly Father right? So if dad spoiled us, there's an expectation. Look, my dad bought me the new car. My dad this, my dad that. Then why isn't he providing for me? People grow disenchanted and in the end they end up, and this is the worst and I've seen this a number of times, professing Christians no longer just kind of middle of the road. They turn on Jesus and then resentful, leave the church, poke at people. Not my job. Bible never tells me to sit around trying to figure out who's saved. It doesn't. But I've seen this a number of times when people leave the, the faith resentful. And it's just so sad. Their greatest need is atonement for sins. It was the Passover. Our greatest need is the fulfillment of the Passover, which is the divine Son of God crucified for your sins. Come through the blood. It's not a moral issue. It's a faith issue. On the other side of the cross is a loving Father who says, Now! You're cleansed. Now you're good. Now turn and look at this lost world. We're going to party. You're going to have comfort, perks, benefits, healing. I'll wipe away every tear. I'll restore every relationship. I will do everything anybody could ever want. But not until the second coming. Life here is going to be brutal. Pick up your cross and follow me. Do you see how these messages need to have their proper context? Our Jewish friends completely ignored Isaiah 52 and 53 in their Bible. They completely ignored Psalm 22, which literally their Messiah speaks to them from the cross. They skipped it, and they wanted to go full bore into their greatest need, which was liberation from Rome. Health, wealth, comfort, 
and peace. And all of it comes from the fact that whether we want to admit it or not, whether we realize it or not, we can't stand life in a broken world. This is always something hurts, always something wrong. And so we're always looking for that peace. Look, peace is a beautiful thing. God brought us peace through the cross. Romans 5.1, having been justified, that's declared righteous in the courtroom of God, we have peace with God. Peace. John 16, 33, Jesus is warning them. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. In me, you're going to have peace. We have that union now on the other side of the cross. We're close. We're close with the Father. We're close with the Son. But step out into a nasty, violent world that wants to kill us. Can you take that peace with you? Can you take a peace with you that is not based on your smile? Not based on his provision under this master plan that we so often like to project on one another. And, and I'm not saying it's completely wrong. I'm just saying we have to step back. The fulfillment of the master plan is probably on the other side of that final trumpet. Okay, life's going to be a little bit tough. And we have to live by faith. So what is it you want from Jesus that might tempt you to skip the cross? <laughs> Excuse me. They want a liberation from Rome. Plain and simple. They wanted liberation from Rome over anything else. And so that's what drove Judas to betray. And that's what pushed the crowds to betray as well. And you know what this is a story of? It's a heartbreaking story of the blind and ignorant following the blind and ignorant with absolutely disastrous consequences. Peace comes through the cross. Any perks from your heavenly father come after you're justified, redeemed, etc. in his sight. We cannot get these things out. We would be making essentially the same mistake that this early group of Jewish people did. And I think, you know, that's part of why Jesus wept is there's a little bit of sympathy with us because the blind leading the blind. And I, But yet, nevertheless, the scriptures are clear and his purpose is clear. Life here is, in fact, brutal and tough. But guys... It will absolutely be worth it. We have got to hang in there. We have got to stay faithful and understand. So just a little bit of challenge for you to, to ponder maybe this Passion Week. As you go through, and I would include you, uh, encourage you, excuse me, to read through all the encounters this week, all the ways they went after Jesus, and see if there's any of kind of that stuff in your heart, like, like he hasn't done enough or he's not at peace or what is it that you want from him that maybe is causing you to be a little disenchanted as a Christian? Because maybe we've all kind of bought in a little too much to, to get in the goodies now and not waiting for heaven to get our goodies. So I work through that a little bit. I think it would be really, really healthy. I, I've struggled with this. Why this? Uh, why that? But work through that and then come back to the cross and realize, you know what? The absolute greatest need that any of us have is to hear those amazing words the two sets of words one from jesus he said it is finished on the cross and then to look at the resurrection which we'll do next sunday which is the our heavenly father's way of showing us i accept the death of my son as payment in full for you and that my friends brings peace the road from here to the grave the road from here to glory might be tough are we going to hang it out or are we going to complain and get disenchanted no pick up your cross let's follow him let's stay faithful as a church and watch what he will do sometimes in the here and now but primarily when he returns Look forward to Easter next week. The weather forecast looking beautiful. Hopefully, uh, maybe a few of you will stretch yourselves a little bit and come out and join us. We'd love to have you. In the meantime, just know we're here for you and we'd love to do anything we can to encourage you in your walk. The, the virus really seems to be plummeting. Uh, vaccines are, are getting into most people now that really want them. And so really look forward to the day when we're all together again. Hey, I want to give before we wrap up, um, I'm going to close with prayer on this, but um, I believe it's going to be May 6th or May 7th. Larry, Mesa, and Kay are going to move out of their apartment, which is on the second floor, into a home that's been provided near the beach in Oxnard. And, and Larry's kind of a surfer guy, just here in the ocean, and be able to walk on the beach as he aligns himself to, to continue to fight this cancer. Um, we want to move him as a church. So I'm kind of asking, guys, I don't know, maybe you can get a floating holiday. This would be a chance to pick up your cross a little bit. Take that floating holiday. Let's move this couple and move them right and make sure they don't spend a dime or don't have to worry about it. So if you'd be willing to, uh, don't 
donate your time or truck or whatever, we'd, we'd appreciate that. And I think there's such a good example for our church right now because they literally had to come to terms with all the perks, the perks that all of us look forward to are taken away from them and they're staring death and what comes next in the face. And uh, I think we would do well to adjust ourselves to their circumstances and to their attitude lest we become disenchanted. Not everything is puppy dogs and bowls of, of cherries, is it? It's tough sometimes, and we're with you guys. So, Father in heaven, we just thank you for your son. You so loved and you gave, and he paid a dear price. And I know so many times, Lord, we want to go around that or do this and do that. Help us to come to you through the cross. Help us to have the peace that justification with you brings. And the side perks you, perks you choose to bless are wonderful, but if you don't, Help us to stay the course, to reach as many people as we can, to walk alongside Kate and Larry in this difficult time, and honor you in that, and we will look forward to your kingdom come, Lord. Oh, so much. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And I will see you guys soon. Love you. Take care. If there's anything we can do, please let me know.